The Kohinoor, which is part of the British monarchy's crown jewels, is perhaps the most controversial diamond in the world. It was once a symbol of power, but today it's seen as an example of colonial excesses in South Asia. A new book by authors William Darlimple and Anita Anand is attempting to separate facts from myth while examining the legacy of the Kohinoor. Our correspondent Harvey Ved caught up with him for this exclusive conversation. Take a look. We are joined today by historian and writer William Dalrymple, who has just co-authored a book with Anita Anand on the Kohino Diamond. It's great to have you here, William. Thank you. Uh, tell us a little bit about the history of the diamond. The first reference we have to the Kohino is as late as 1750 in the history of Muhammad Marvi, mm -hmm. who was a Persian historian writing about Nadir Shah's invasion of India. And he says, I saw the Kohino. Mm -hmm. First eyewitness description of it. I saw the Kohinoor, it was attached to the head of a peacock on top of the peacock throne. Uh, at this, I saw it when it was in Herat, which is where Western Afghanistan, when Nadir Shah took it from Delhi. Before that, there is nothing. And so I began to ask myself why this was. Why did this elaborate fake history accumulate? And the answer is that two years after the British seized the stone in, in 1849, it was put into the Great Exhibition in London, in the Crystal Palace. And it, six million people, a third of the population of Britain, queued to see the diamond. It became a, the rock star of gems. Everyone wanted to see the koh And after that, when it had become so famous, after that, every piece of information about big diamonds in Indian sources is assumed to be the koh mm -hmm. But in actual fact, there are many great Indian diamonds. There are at least five huge ones. What was the kind of research that went into writing this book? Well. I started by talking to all the experts on moguls, gems, and, and, and uh, his, uh, gemologists, and, and diamond history. And I rapidly became aware that there was a strong consensus among them that the popular history of the koh was bunkum. That there's simply no evidence for all this past, that, which is written up and, and, and restated and restated over and over again as if it's fact. And they were very clear that you know, it's only when it really gets to Nadir Shah that the stone suddenly enters history. Then it goes to Afghanistan. Uh, and, and there's a lot of very good Afghan sources. So I first came to this when I was writing my last book, Return of a King. Mm. I went to Afghanistan and gathered all these Afghan sources for the 18th and 19th century. The man who, who helped me most was the then Chancellor of Kabul University, a man called Ashraf Ghani, who is now, of course, the, the president of the country. How is the diamond indispensable in the politics and culture of South Asia and Britain? Once it's turned into a symbol of colonialism, it becomes a symbol for South Asians. But as I say, I mean, future generations of historians may do better than I, but I have not been able to find a single Indian source for it before it actually leaves in 1751. Uh, there's lots, of course, in Ranjit Singh's period, but for the early period, there's almost no mention of it. And that's partly because for the Mughals, they loved diamonds, but they preferred rubies and spinels. The Modi government says that it was neither gifted nor stolen. What are your thoughts on this statement? Well, I mean, there are many mysteries about the Kohinoor, but how it got into British hands is not a mystery at all. It's one thing we know absolutely for certain. And the answer is that in 1849, the British fought the Sikhs in, in the Second Anglo-Sikh War. Uh, the East India Company uh, defeated uh, the Khalsa. And in the treaty which ended that war, uh, the Kohinoor uh, was specifically given to Queen Victoria. Uh, it was, it was the, the spoils of victory. Pakistan lays claim on it because it was handed over under the Treaty of Lahore. But it was signed by a minor. What do you think of that? Yes, it was signed by a minor. So in, in, in many ways you could say it's, it's invalid. The, the complication there is that the same Treaty of Lahore also gave India its right to Kashmir uh, because it, that was part of the Sikh dominions. And I think my understanding uh, Having, uh, since the book came out, uh, having talked to, uh, for example, Swapan Dasgupta, who's both a historian and a Rajya Sabha member, uh, he certainly believes that that odd position by the Modi government um, is because the, 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 the government believes that if they undo the Treaty of Lahore, then they lose their claim to Kashmir. Uh, I don't know whether that's true or not, incidentally, but that's, that's, it, it's, has a, it, ha, it could explain this, this very odd statement last April. Indians continue to associate Kohinoor with something that was rightfully theirs, but was stolen from them. Kohinoor, in that sense, becomes synonymous to patriotism. Is it a lack of proper history education, or is there a deeper political connotation to it? 
So I'm totally sympathetic to to the fact that you know this is this. I mean, there's no question it came from India. There's no question it was taken by force. Um, the reality is that the British government is unlikely is is as unlikely to um, give it back as as uh, to India or, or or let it let it go as the Indian government is likely to let Kashmir go. Uh, whatever the rights and wrongs of the case, they won't do it in reality. So I think, in a sense, that it's more interesting to, to try and just distinguish fact from fiction um, as historians rather than speculating on the future um, uh, or, or lobbying one way or the other. I mean, my personal position is that uh, I agree with Shashi Thoreau that the British need to make a, a whole series of apologies for what they did in India. Uh, in the same way as the Germans have done over the Holocaust, and, and uh, 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 yeah, there's, there's the many examples of nations making formal apologies for past wrongs, and I think Britain needs to do that. I can't see what the problem is. Why can't they say Gillian Wallabag was an atrocity?